Okay, so we'll share the screen. Look at the at the parsha. So we talk about Genesis chapter two, creation of Adam and Eve, creation of the uh, of the um, Garden of Eden. Um, then Adam and so presumably they're in garden. They, they are in uh, they are in the Garden of Eden. If you look at at chapter at, at verse yeah verse fifteen, now the Lord God took the man. And he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. And then is the commandment of God says, don't eat the tree of the, don't eat of that you should eat. Of every tree of the, of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Okay. And that's a tree of knowledge. And then verse 19 is interesting. Verse 19, 20. And the Lord God formed from the earth every beast of the field, and every fowl of the heavens, which we already discussed in chapter one. We're in chapter two now. And he brought it to man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called each living thing, that was its name. That's verse 19, verse 20. And man named all the cattle and all the, and the fowl of the heavens and all the beasts of the field. But for man, he did not find a helpmate opposite him. And basically, uh, naming things is categorizing he can't. He can't find. He can't find a, a mate for himself. And then you read about the story about the creation of Eve. And then if you continue chapter three, again we go to chapter three. And after the entire discussion of the idea of the tree of the, of the, of the story of the tree of knowledge, we jump back to we jump back to the naming. And it says that God, uh, Adam, named his wife Chava Eve because she was the mother of every living being. And Rashi says something absolutely fascinating over there. Rashi says that the whole story of, of the Garden of Eden, which we think is one of the most interesting stories of Genesis, is really a parenthesis. It's really parenthetically because what it's really coming to do is tell us how Adam named Eve, and it's a continuation to Adam naming everything. In other words, something is happening here with the naming, and what it, and, and the question is, what is significance about the naming? Um, so we'll start by looking at the Medrash, and the Medrash makes it even more confusing. So we look at the Medrash. We look at the Medrash. Just gonna make it a little bigger so I can see. Okay, I'll read the Medrash. Says the Medrash. The Medrash relates when the Holy One, blessed be He, approached the creation of man, he consulted the ministering angels. They asked him, this man, what is his nature? He replied, his wisdom surpasses yours. That the, that, that the uh, wisdom of man surpasses that of the wisdom of the angels. To demonstrate this, God brought various types of animals before the angels and asked them, what are their names? The angels did not know what to reply. God then presented the animals to Adam and asked him, what are their names? Pointing to each one, he answered, this is an ox, this is a donkey. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the sort of the, 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 the proof that man is more wise than the angels. So that's the medrash. And the question is, does this medrash explain anything? Or does this medrash create more questions than answers? Um, yeah, here's the link. So. What, in other words, the premise is as follows. The premise is that a name is not just a convention. It's not just people get together and decide to refer to an ox as an ox and a, uh, an animal, you know, sheep as a sheep. We're talking here about Hebrew. And certainly according to the Kabbalists, the Hebrew letters are the letters through which the world created, the, the God created the world. And therefore, if you're able to see the name of this object, you know something about this, the, the, the energy of this object. If you could say this is a shore, an ox in Hebrew, it's you have insight into the sort of spiritual DNA of the creation. That's the premise. Now, the question is, so that's what we're going to get at, but it's still not going to help us because we would expect that the angels should have more insight to that than man. And here we say that man can call the animals there by their names, but the angels cannot. So that's going to be that's going to be interesting. So let's continue. Let's continue reading the essay. How does Adam's ability 
to name all of the animals, demonstrate his wisdom. So there's a Kabbalistic work called Shala, which predates the Hasidic movement, 17th century sage. And in fact, many of the Kabbalistic concepts, many of the Hasidic concepts are premised on the Shala. Hasidim say that Tanya is based on the Maharal and the Shala. In any case, the Shala says as follows. Shala explains that the name of every entity in the holy tongue alludes to its spiritual source, which we refer to Hebrew as the Shana Kodesh, the holy tongue. It's the, it's the language through which God created the world. It's right, God said, let there be light. Yeah, but which, what did he say it in? Did he say it in Japanese and Chinese and French and English? He said it in Hebrew. Now, he didn't say it the way we say it, but in other words, those letters, that energy that is symbolized with these letters of whatever the creation was, is the energy that creates that letter. So says the Shalaf, right? The name of every entity in the holy tongue alludes to its spiritual source. Adam grasped the spiritual source of every created being and named it accordingly. This was a reflection of his wisdom. To quote Shala, by knowing the created beings on this lonely plane, he was able to know the mystical secret of the supernal chariots. Um, so this is an interesting concept. You talk about the mystical secret of the supernal chariot. What is the supernal chariot? If you read the prophet of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter one, you read that there is that Ezekiel has a vision and she's a wagon, a chariot, and the chariots have uh, different faces and different wheels, and there's faces of a man and faces of, a, of an ox and of a eagle and of a lion. Uh, that, is, that is a symbol to spiritual phenomena. Now, says the Shalah, if you could look at a creation down here and you could name it, that means you can have insight to its spiritual source. That's the Shalah's contribution. I'll take Vicky's question in a second. I just want to finish the paragraph. Um, so, and now he quotes, after the Shalah, we quote the Magi, that, which was the, the disciple of the Baal Shem the founder of the Hasidic movement. The Magi, the Mezrichinist, or, or, or Torah, elaborates explaining similar concepts in his interpretation of the verse. Whatever Adam would call every being, that was its name. So this is something that... Uh, that I want to go back to the verse for, for a second. What is the verse says like this, verse 19 and 20. Verse 19 says like this. Um, God, the Lord God formed from the earth every beast of the field and every fowl of the heavens, and he brought it to man to see what he what he would call it. Fine. And then let's go to verse 20. And man named all the cattle. Wonderful. What is the end of verse 19? And whatever the man called each living thing, that was its name. What does that add? So the Magid says, whatever man called each living thing, that was its true name in heaven. In other words, it's not a name of convention. Adam and Eve get together. Adam decides to write a dictionary and refer to different creations by different things. Says the Torah, no, according to the Magid's interpretation. What the Torah is telling you, that whatever man named it, that is really its true name. In other words, it's not that people called it because Adam named it that way. Adam named, Adam was able to get to its true name. What's its true name? Its true name is the spiritual energy. So that is the, 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 now we already have a few layers. We have the verse that emphasizes that Adam names the animals. We have the medrash, which says that this is great insight because in fact, the angels cannot do it and only Adam could do it. And then we asked, okay, so what's the big deal to name something? What's the big deal to name something? And then we say, well, so here comes the Kabbalistic Hasidic interpretation that says, no, naming something means you're able to see the spiritual DNA, the spiritual source of this creation. So that's, that, that's what we have so far. And again, we're going to ask if that is what naming is, seeing the spiritual source of everything, the angels should know that more than men. So that is, that, that's, what, that's what we're getting. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Oh, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is not about the angels, but about the, the Hashem's creation, because um, before there was a light, he said there be lights, right? So, uh, so when it comes to not leaving things, they are created by Hashem's word. When it comes to leaving things, was it deliberate that he just formed it from the earth without naming, leaving the naming to Adam? So that's a very good question. In other words, when you talk about Hashem created the world, Hashem created the world with 10 utterances. In other words, there were 10 statements. Um, the Kabbalistic interpretation elaborated, the Hasidic movement elaborates upon this. It's in, this, in the first chapter, the second section of Tanya. 
says that the words that Hashem created, when God says, let there be firmament, let there be heaven, those letters that God spoke, that energy, those letters have to constantly create the firmament. Okay. That same chapter, Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, one second, what about all the creations that God did not mention them explicitly? A stone. Doesn't say in 10 other instances, God there said, let there be stone. Right? The animals doesn't say let there be a specific animal. The animal, it just says, let there be animals. Let there be birds. Let, let there be fowl. Let there be fish. It doesn't say any specific. So what do you, so what is, so what letters, so, so how, do, how, do, how, how do those creations that have not been explicitly named vegetation, right? There's so many different types of vegetation. None of these are named. So how, so how do they get their source? So Rabbi Shneir Zaman says, well, that's the secret. In Kabbalah, there's, there's all kinds of combination of letters and gematria. And letters could, could, could fill in for other letters. In other words, that when God says, let there be light or let there be uh, animals, that energy is too general. And if it would go, it can't, they cannot create a specific creation. Then those energies break up into pieces. They combine, they switch, they conceal themselves through the method of, like, for example, gematria, which is the numerical value with different letters could, could switch, exchange each other because they have, have can, 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 can uh, create the same numerical value even and, and the word changes but the numerical value stays and all kinds of other ways of letters changing and therefore every specific creation gets its light from the 10 utterances even though this specific creation was not mentioned explicitly in the 10 utterances that is what Rabbi Shneir Zalman explains uh, based on the Kabbalistic sources in the first chapter of the second section of time so what are we saying here we're saying yes God says let there be let, let there be animals now, that general statement breaks up into all kinds of letters and deforms different names of different sp individual species. Now, Adam's wisdom is he could see this individual species, link it back to its source, either in the 10 utterances, but we're saying even higher in the spiritual worlds, and say, ah, this thing, this is an ox, this is a shore. So it's Shin Vav Resh. You're not going to find Shin Vav Resh in the 10 utterances. Yeah, but you can figure out how these, 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 these three letters are linked to what some phrase and some combination of the 10 utterances. So that takes a tremendous amount of wisdom to be able, because again, if everything was said explicitly, then everything was said explicitly. But if it wasn't said explicitly, then you need Adam's wisdom. So that was by design, basically. So it was left to, for oh, Adam. Why that is and what the challenge is and why and so we're going to get to. The first thing we have to understand, to, be, to crack the code, we have to figure out why can't the angels do this? If you're saying that to name something, you have to know its spiritual source, spirituality is the domain of the angels. Spirituality, the angels should know. We, we, we mentioned briefly before the, the, the spiritual chariot. We'll talk about that. The source of the ox is the, is the ox of the chariot. The ox of the chariot is a fancy way of saying angels. The source of the animal is the angel, but the angel doesn't know the source of the animal. It's, it's strange. So we have to figure out what is it that the angels cannot do and once we figure out what is it that the angels cannot do, we see how this is actually naming things is actually not as simple as it sounds. And then we see, ah, that's the power of, of Adam. But it's not just Adam, it's really the human being. Because in some sense, as we will see, spoiler alert, if you don't want to ruin the class, close your ears, we're all Adam and we all have to do the same spiritual concept of naming the animals, of naming all the phenomenon of this world. So, so, so that's, that, that's the journey for today. It's only 10.19, we still have a few more minutes. Okay, so I'm going to read one or two questions from th that the Rebbe is going to ask that I mentioned already, and then we'll go to, we'll, we'll, we'll start getting into the explanation. So the Rebbe says like this, start from first we have to understand two points require explanation. A, the ability to comprehend the spiritual source of every entity in this physical world seemingly does not stem from an abundance of wisdom. For knowing the mystical secret of the supernal chariots does not depend on the abundance of one's wisdom, but rather on the refinement of one's powers of comprehension. The more refined the person's abilities and the closer they are to the spiritual, the higher the levels of the spiritual realms the person can grasp. So we're dealing with the technicality. The Medrash says that this proves the fact that Adam could name animals proves that he's wise, wiser than, than, the, than the sages. Than the, than the animal, than the, than the wiser than the angels. They're saying it's got nothing to do with wisdom. It has to do with having a sense for spirituality. If you could sense spirituality, you can connect. You could you you have it. You have it. You have an innate connection to spirituality. 
then you could sense the spiritual energy of things. But it's not wisdom. It's not, it's not logic. So that's the first question. And the second important question is probably more important. How is it possible to assert that the angels did not know the names of the entities in the material world? According to the above explanation, that the knowledge of the animals' names depended on the knowledge of the mystical secret of the supernal chariots, i.e. the spiritual source of the created beings, the angel should have possessed this knowledge because the supernal chariots themselves comprise the angels. These angels are the spiritual source of the animals in this physical world. It is for this reason that the prophets describe the angels as animals. How then could it be that the angels did not know the names of the animals in this world? So animals is actually a good thing. You look at the prophets. We mentioned this in the past. The angels refer to the to the prophets as as as, as the, the I'm sorry the, the prophets refer to the angels as animals. We talk about of the ofanim is is the animals that are referred to as the wheels and chayot hakodesh holy animals. Um, like I said, the chariot, the divine chariot, which is a metaphor for um, the angels that God that that carry God's presence in the world. The angels also are, are, have images of animals. The idea here is that the, the angels, why are the angels animals? Because the angels are the sources of the animals in this world. So what are you telling me? Adam is so wise. He could sense the source of the cow. What's the, the what source of the ox? What's the source of the ox? The angel. Okay, and the angel doesn't know that the source of the ox is the angel? That is, what, the angels seemingly should know that even more than Adam. So that is what's 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 intriguing about this, um, about this about this discussion. Now we're going to start the explanation by introducing another point. Why is Adam wasting his time? Adam he has to go to every zoo, and every jungle, and every and name every animal. We're talking about Adam before the sin. Adam is in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, the verse says God place the, the Torah. The Torah the Torah says God places Adam and Eve. In the garden, the Avda Ulashamra, to work it and to guard it. Now, certainly the Kabbalist literally means you have to take care of the garden. You're a busy guy. You don't have time to be a zoologist, right? You have to take care of the garden. But spiritually speaking, it also means that to serve God, the Avda Ulashamra, to work the garden represents work serving God. So we're talking about Adam, intensely spiritual person in the, in the Garden of Eden before the sin. He has nothing better to do with his time than to name animals. So that, that, leads us to, 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 the, to the insight that no, naming animals is in itself serving God. Naming animals in itself is a spiritual pursuit. So that's just getting at this, at the, the, we're getting from another angle. We're trying to figure out here what is happening here. So the first angle we get at, we say angels can't do, only Adam can't do it, even angels cannot do it. So that tells you this is significance. And now we're saying it's so significant that this is part of Adam's service. And therefore, we had no distractions. You could say Adam was ADD. You know, you tell someone to go, uh, go, go, go plant the garden. Say, I'd rather, I'd rather count the, the birds and name the birds. Not interested, not interested in working. No, this is Adam before the sin. No distraction. He's completely doing the will of God. And what is he doing? He's sitting and uh, and what is he doing? He's sitting and he's uh, he's sitting and and naming animals. Oh, so the naming animals must be significant. So that's another introduction to get us to the significance. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, thank you. Sorry for asking so many questions. Um, um, I, I have a question. So what was the scope of, of that naming project? So the, the plants were already named, right? No, it doesn't no. say about the plants. It doesn't say. Oh, so the, the tree of knowledge didn't have its name either. No, it did. It did. It did. It got, it does say earlier, I don't know if it was named, it does say God says from all the trees of the, of, of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not, you shall not eat. Was every last tree named? Maybe, maybe not. Presumably, either Adam did it or he's waiting for us to do it. Again, doesn't say so clearly. The animals, it says clearly. Because again, we're trying to figure out how Adam is supposed to name the animals and ultimately name himself and name his wife. So, so maybe animals are closer to the human being. That's why we tell the story about the animals. But once we, get, once we get past this, once we get to the interpretation, you'll see that the concept would apply to any creation. Thank you. But the Torah explicitly says it specifically about the mammals. And the Torah does describe, without getting into what's already beyond the scope of the discussion here, the Torah does describe that, that initially Adam is really thinking of himself as an animal, as a mammal, and he names everything. And then after he names everything, then we mentioned the verse, then he found no, no companion for himself. And then he needs Eve. 
So initially he thinks, oh, I'll be with the animals. That's fine. I'll hang out with them. I'll name them. I will be able to, to you know, that, that, that would have that, that would bring the companionship. And then he learns that he can't do that, right? So it's interesting that the mammal, that, that according to, that's what the Medrash says. But according to that, the Medrash is not saying about the naming. It's just saying about, about, about why the story comes in, right? Let's see if Rashi says it. There's some Rashi's on here, which could be interesting. It's, it's off topic, but maybe it's interesting anyway. Um, show Rashi's commentary. Where are we? Here, look at verse 21. Oh, I didn't share it. So Genesis chapter two, verse 21. So verse 20 said, and man named all the cattle and the fowl of the heavens and all the beasts of the field. But for man, he did not find a helpmate opposite him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man and he, and he slept and he took one of his sides and he closed the flesh in his place and that's Eve, okay? So what happens here? How do we get to Eve? We get from naming the animals is verse 20 and verse 21, even in verse 20 itself, it says man did not find a helpmate, so we need a helpmate. How does the helpmate have anything to do? How does the companion have anything to do with the animals? Says Rashi like this. Um, and the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall, Genesis Rabbah, Medrash Rabbah. When he brought them the animals, he brought before him every species, male and female. He, Adam, said, everyone has a mate, but I have no mate. Immediately, and God, and God caused to fall. In other words, he says, I have no mate, now I need, now I need a mate. But let's continue, it gets even worse. This is actually a little, a little, a little, a little strange, but verse don't tell me I don't tell you everything. Everything's on the table here. Verse 23, and man said, this time it is a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called Isha, woman, because this one was taken from an Ish, man. I hope I don't ruin your sleep tonight, but here we go. This time, this teaches us that Adam came to all the animals and beasts in search of a mate. Now, this is just a euphemism. Ba'al kol means he had relations with all the beasts, with all the animals and all the beasts in search for a mate, but he was not satisfied until he found Eve. Now, this is from the Talmud. Now, take this literally or not is not, is not is not the point here. The point here is that there's a struggle here. Adam is and initially is looking for, he sees beasts, he sees animals. He thinks that, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm maybe a little bit more sophisticated, but I'm just a beast. And, and then he says, no, he's not a beast. He, he, he's, he's lonely amongst the beasts. And that's part of the next story, which is, that, which, is, which is when the snake is talking to Eve. And we can talk about it tomorrow. The snake is basically telling Eve that you're a beast. And you have to follow your instincts the way a beast does. And the reality is that the story is really that, no, we're not a beast. We name the beasts. Um, so, so, so I'm just saying the fact that the Torah is only, it's just a long way of saying the fact that the Torah only names the beasts, maybe, is, is maybe perhaps it's because that's the struggle. That's what, Adam, that's what Adam is dealing with at the time, right? He doesn't necessarily sense that closeness to the other creations. Okay, so now this is another another introduction which I mentioned earlier. He's sitting in the Garden of Eden before the before the sin. Um, this whatever he's doing there is part of serving God, and yet he's naming the animals. So naming the animals has must have spiritual significance. So here we go. The above can be resolved by prefacing the following explanation: Adam named the animals before the sin of the tree of knowledge while he was in the Garden of Eden. At that time, Adam and all existence were in a state of perfection. God had placed Adam in the Garden of Eden for a purpose, to cultivate it and to guard it. Accordingly, we can appreciate that everything Adam did at the time, particularly every act that Torah relates, was directed toward that purpose. Furthermore, cultivating and tending a garden improves it. Similarly, Adam's cultivating and guarding the Garden of Eden infuses it with a loftier level of holiness than that which it possesses previously. But Ebed doesn't even say it explicitly. He assumes we understand that when it says to work it and to cultivate it, we don't just mean to get better fruit. We mean it's that, 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 that cultivating the garden is also a symbol of serving God, of bringing more holiness into the world. So to, 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 to guard it means keep it the way it is, don't ruin it. But the Abda, to work it, to cultivate it, means you're making it better. So Adam is in a state of perfection. He's supposed to make it better. And he's spending his time um, naming the animals. So obviously naming the animals is part of cultivating the world, meaning raising it to a loftier level. Explanation is called for. What is the divine service involved in naming the created beings? What did it accomplish? And in what way did it enhance the Garden of Eden? According to the previous explanation, 
Adam did not bring anything new by naming the created beings since they had received their life force from their root and source even before he named them. Adam only related to the, the correct name of every created being in accordance with its source. So this is beautiful. This question is a very nice question. What is that ever saying? Assuming we take everything, everything, everything that the Medrash says, Every spirit, every every created being, every animal or any other created being, we're talking about the animals. Every animal has a spiritual source. Adam is so wise, he could see the spiritual source of this animal, and therefore he could know the name of this animal. Wonderful. Are you increasing holiness? No. Because even before you name the animal, if the animal is, existence, is in existence, it's because it's connected to its spiritual source, because its spiritual source gives it energy. So this animal was a shore was an ox even before Adam, Adam named it. So you're telling me that Adam just named it means he, he, he made known something that already existed. But if you're saying this is all part of Adam cultivating the land, the earth, the, gar the garden or the world, which would mean making it better. So somehow naming makes something better, but does na naming make something better or it just classifies or in our case, it just reveals that which already exists. So we come into this at many different questions and many different sources, but we'll get, we're, we're getting very close to the point here. And the point is there's something deeper going on here, which we have to figure out what it is. Okay, what is the conclusion of all these questions? So the conclusion leads us to two points, two short points, and that gives us to them, and that will bring us the answer. Thus, it is necessary to say, a, grasping the root and source of the created being's vitality is not sufficient to name them appropriately. How do you know that? Because if that's all it took to know the source of a created being, then the angels know the source of the created being. Okay, but the angels can't name the animal. Okay, so just knowing the spiritual source is not enough. That's A. B, only Adam could give the created beings their appropriate names because his wisdom surpassed that of the angels. Okay, so how do, what do we do with all this? So now we get to the answer. To explain the above in further detail, every created being in this physical world has a source in the spiritual realms, not just animals, every created being. As our sages state, every single blade of grass in this world has a spiritual source that compels it to grow. So in other words, every creation, the premise is every creation doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a spiritual energy that gives it energy and gives it life. By way of illustration, talking about the animals now, by way of illustration, the source of an ox in this earthly world is the angel with the face of an ox in the divine chariot. As I mentioned, divine chariot, Ezekiel sees a chariot, he sees four wheels, he sees one of the wheels has the face of, a, of an ox. So the source of the ox down here is the chariot, is the face of the ox in the chariot. Nevertheless, although the created being derives from that spiritual source, a physical, physical animal cannot at all be compared to its spiritual source. The hierarchy of spiritual realms entails hishtal shalus, which is a process of gradual chain-like descent from one level to another. However, no matter how many chain-like descents take place, a physical entity will not come into being from a spiritual source. For as it is well known, being a material entity into, bringing a material entity into being from its spiritual source can only be accomplished by God through his uh, omnipotence. Only God whose power is infinite can make possible the radical transition necessary for physical entities to come into being from their source in the spiritual, in, in the supernal spiritual realms. What are we saying here? We're saying here as follows. Yes, of course, every creation has a spiritual source, granted. Um, nevertheless, just because you say every um, creation has a spiritual source, nevertheless, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot necessarily compare the creation down here, the ox down here to the ox and the, the ox, which is the angel and the divine chariot. Why? Because at some point, even if you're going to go down level to level like a chain like descent, at some point, the change from a spiritual energy to something physical, that change is so radical that the gap between the source and the created being is too great that you can't link the two. So where does that leave us? So where does that leave us? This represents, okay, no. for this reason, 
since the physicality of creation being is incomparable to, of the creator being is incomparable to, and thus seemingly unconnected to its source, simply knowing, for example, that the source of an ox on the material plane is the angel with the face of an ox in the divine chariot is not sufficient to give an ox in the, on, the, on the material plane its name. It appears impossible to associate one to the other, one with the other. This represented Adam's achievements. As, in, as indicated by the verse, Adam called all the animals by name. The Hebrew term call, kore, also connotes call forth. Adam called forth the name, the spiritual source of the created being, and doing so enabled it to be manifest within the physical being that was created from its source. Okay, this is a very interesting concept. What we're saying here is like this. Yes, everybody knows that the angel down here, that wasn't a big secret. The angels understood. They know that the, the, the chariot, they know the spiritual source. They know that the face of the angel in the chariot because they are the face. They know the face of the ox in the chariot because the angels are the face of the ox in the chariot. Some of the angels are ox, some angel, angels, lions, etc. Nevertheless, and the angels also know that the animals down here descend from the spiritual source. However, if you took an angel on a ride to the Bronx Zoo and you say, look at this ox, you see this ox? The source of this ox is you. And that's why, please name this ox. The angel says, I can't help you. I don't see how this created being is linked to, to me, to link to the spiritual source. I can't name it because name it means you see this and it reminds you of the other. And the angel says, I see no connection between the physical being and the, spir and the, spir and the spiritual entity. And we'll see later how it happens. But what does Adam do? What's Adam's contribution? Adam's contribution is, no, I could call forth, calling the animals by name. I can call forth, I can sort of bring down into this created being the consciousness of its source. And therefore, I only, Adam, could name the animal based on its spiritual source. So what was one of the big questions? The big question is, are, how come the angels can't do this? Aren't the angels more spiritual than Adam? Shouldn't the angels know? Whoops. Aren't the angels more spiritual than Adam? Shouldn't the angels know, have knowledge of the spiritual source of creation? And the answer is the problem with the angels is that they're too spiritual. They know the spiritual source of creation. What they don't know is they can't see that intense spirituality in the physical world. How could a physical entity, how could an ox grazing in the, in the field, how could you say that this actually stems from the ox, which is the angel? Why the angels called an ox, we'll get to that later. But, but, but they didn't see a connection between the physical entity and its spiritual source. And that's the Adam's brilliance and spiritual power. Adam could come and say, no, when I look at this ox, I could see, I could sense its spiritual source in the divine chariot. So that's the first step of our explanation. Hopefully we'll add, add a few layers. So in short, a question was, what is it that Adam could do and the angels cannot? And according to the Shalom, the, the Kabbalistic commentary, it was that what Adam did, he connects, he, he can see the source of this ox. So the question was, the angel certainly knows the source of this ox. Yeah, but the answer is the angel knows the source of the ox. The angel doesn't know, doesn't see, and doesn't sense how the ox in the physical world eating, eating hay, how that ox is linked to its spiritual source because the gap is too big. Adam can bridge the gap. Adam can sense within this creation, bring down within this creation, its spiritual source. That is actually, by the way, one of the questions were, is, is Adam increasing the holiness by naming? Because you say he's cultivating the garden by naming. The answer is yes, he's cultivating the garden because he's helping this created being sense its spiritual consciousness. So that's, and that's actually increasing the holiness. Okay, so I'm skipping a little. We'll go to section five. So to, to, to spell out what we said here, I'm skipping a little, section five. On this basis, we can understand why Adam possessed the capacity to name the angels, whereas the angels did not. I'm sorry. Why Adam possessed the capacity to name the animals, whereas the angels did not. The angels recognized the spiritual source of each of the animals. They knew, for example, that the source of an ox is the angel with the face of an ox and the divine chariot. Nevertheless, the angels did not have the ability to bring about a bond between a created being spiritual source and its existence on this physical plane. Okay, I'm going to skip the next paragraph, even though it's fascinating. You know, let's not skip it. In the end of Genesis, the Torah talks about 
the end of this parasha, Torah talks about Nephilim. There were Nephilim giants on land, on the earth. And they helped the world become corrupt because they were corrupt. So what was the Nephilim? It means they were giants. So one word, one Hebrew, one, one meaning of the word Nephilim is a giant. The problem is that the Nephilim also means to fall, to fall down. That's the much more common source. Nafal, Nephilim, is falling down. So the Medra says, who are these Nephilim? Who are these giants? They were the angels. And the Medra says a story like this. The Medra says that when the angels see that man becomes corrupt, they come to God and they say, you have to destroy the world because man became corrupt. And, and, and it's so terrible. And God says, what's the big, what's the, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to, you have to, you have to um, expect them to become corrupt. It's not their fault. We live in a corrupt world. We live in a physical world. So what do you want? Of course, they're going to be corrupt. So the angels say, no, no, no. If we come down into this world, we could maintain our, our morality. And God says, okay, so we'll give it a shot. So the angels come down. They come, they, since they're angels, they come down in a very, in a very they have a very, um, they're giants in the sense they're very powerful beings. And of course, they become corrupt. So that's what the Medrash says. What are we doing with this Medrash? What we're saying is angels are intensely spiritual. The second they come in contact with the physical, they're going to fall. They cannot be, stay in the physical world and remain connected to their spiritual source. That's why, again, the same problem with the naming. They, of course, understand the spiritual source of, of, of the creation, but they can't sense within the creation a spiritual source. They can't link the two. So let's read this inside. Um, this refers to a related concept. On the verse, the Nephilim existed on the earth. That's, again, the end of this week's parasha. It is explained that the word Nephilim has the same three-letter root, nafal, as the word nofel, fall. The Nephilim were angels that had fallen from their spiritual rung. Right, the footnote is 24, Zohar. Um, yeah, okay. But it's the Medrash. It's mentioned in the Medrash as well. For when an angel comes into the material world, he falls. He cannot overcome the material orientation of this world. An angel does not have the capacity to live in this world and simultaneously be connected with godliness, which transcends the world. And here comes Adam. What is Adam? So we discussed this in the fact. In the past, Adam is really a bridge between heaven and earth. Adam is, in some sense, he's a beast. In some sense, he has a spiritual soul. So Adam is a hybrid. And because Adam, unlike the angels, the angels are not hybrids. They're, they're spiritual, but if they come down, they're going to fall down. And, and a human being is a hybrid, and a human being could connect the heaven and earth. And therefore, he is able to name the animals, meaning to say, sense within this physical world, bring down the spiritual source of the existence within this physical world. So let's finish, let's, let's finish, uh, let's finish this next paragraph. Um, that capacity is granted specifically to man. Adam, Hebrew for man, relates to the phrase Adamela Elyon, I resemble the one above. The word Adam is a very interesting. On one hand, it's called, the Rebbe doesn't say it here, but the verse says that Adam comes from the word Adama, earth. So on one hand, the man is earthly. On the other hand, Adam, this is actually from the Shalaf, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that we mentioned earlier. Adam, Adam comes from the word Adame, I am similar to the one above, I reflect the one above. So Adam, the human being, is a hybrid. I resemble the one of I, man resembles God who is absolutely without limits. Man is made up of spiritual and material elements, i.e., from both the higher realms and the lower realms. He thus has the capacity to unite the higher realms with the lower realms, enabling a created being of this material plane to unite with the higher realms, its source above. And that's why Adam is superior to the angels. If, even if you say, well, if, this, if, they, if, we, if what's at stake here is knowing the spiritual source, don't the, don't the angels know the spiritual source? Of course, the angels know the spiritual source. That's part of the problem. Problem is they're intensely spiritual, but they have no connection to the physical. They come into this world, they're going to they're going to fall apart. They're going to fall low. They can't have a foot in both worlds. But if you talk about Adam, what is Adam? Adam is on one hand earth, on one hand similar to the divine, godly soul, animal soul. He is earth from the ground, dust from the earth. But also God blows uh, um, 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 a soul. Blow, God blows into his nostrils a breath of life. So it's that combination. Okay, so Adam could do both. Adam could connect to heaven and the earth. Okay, beautiful. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, thank you. Uh, I hope it's a quick question. So if Adam uh, named all the animals knowing their spiritual source and connecting spiritual to physical existence, did he also name a snake and understood his purpose? And, and is, is that why uh, the snake came to Eve first, not the Adam? Those are the last three words you said. Is that why the snake what? Is that is that why? why the snake came to Eve first, not to Adam? 
because Adam knew his spiritual, his spiritual source and, and uh, the purpose of his existence. That could be. That's a good point. That's a good point. So Adam, presumably, if Adam knows the the angel, the Adam know, yeah, Adam would be able to sense within the created being its spiritual source. So he would have deeper insight into the psyche of the snake. That's a good point. That's a good point. Now, I'm going to say one more point here um, because it helps us bring it down more to our spiritual life and it connects it to the prayer. So I'll say it. There's a lot more to talk about it in this talk. Um, just to give you a, a heads up where this talk is going, we, on one hand, we say Adam connects heaven and earth. On the other hand, we say the real connection between heaven and earth did not happen until the giving of the Torah. So we're gonna. That, so the essay sort of continues in dealing with that problem, not problem, that the two stages and the connection of heaven and earth. But I don't really want to go there right now. What I want to do is to do one more, a few more paragraphs and discuss um, an sort of an, an, an application of this concept in our daily life and in our prayers. So I mentioned this before, so you may have heard this. Um, <clears throat> We prepare every morning. There's a biblical commandment to say the Shema. Shema is part of love the Lord your God. That's that's part of the Shema. How do you love God? We're physical beings. We like we like coffee. We like uh, we like Danishes. We like knishes. How do you love God? Okay, so we have blessings. We have the prayer to prepare us for the, for the love to to be able to get that to get to that level of love of God. What do we do in these prayers? So later we had more songs, but the essential the sages. Uh, the rabbi, the, the 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 men of the great assembly, going back to Ezra, going back twenty four hundred years, the, the sages who instituted prayer gave us two 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 blessings. Second blessing is one topic. First blessing talks all about angels. The angels love to God. The angels sing to God. So the Kabbalists say, "What am I? What do I need to talk about the angels? Talk about the souls. We talk about the angels." So there's a beautiful Kabbalistic concept, and it says like this: What part of us are we trying to cultivate to love God? the godly soul, the godly soul loves God. We have to cultivate the animal soul. We have to cultivate the part of self that is animalistic in nature, that wants that self-oriented. So what do we tell the animal soul? We say, we're going to talk to you about the angels. You know why? Because the angels are your source. And if you get to the source, if you talk about the source of the, of, of the animal soul, then the animal soul will be moved. That's what we say. And that's what we're going to mention here. What are we really saying here? What we're really saying here is, what does the animal soul want? The animal soul, there's different types of animals. Self-oriented. Somebody, I'm, I'm self-oriented, so I want to rob a bank. Other people are a little bit more refined. I'm self-oriented, so I want to uh, do whatever, you know, amass wealth in a kosher way. Fine, it's all self-orientation, but it's all self-love. What, what are we telling the animal soul? You have to understand that the concept of love that you have and in your life is directed toward materialism, that concept of love, of desire, of the desirable, does not, it didn't start in this world. It has a spiritual source. What is the source of all love? Source of all love is the animal, meaning the angel that has an animalistic passion to love God. So what we're telling the animal down here, what you think, you think you want comfort. You think you want pleasure. You do, but you don't understand what the true pleasure is because you're just an animal. You have to go to your source and understand that the true animal loves God. The true, God is the true source of all pleasure and all love. So what we're trying to do really when we pray every morning, we're trying to connect our own animalistic tendencies with the source of those animalistic tendencies, which is the tendencies and the love and the desire and the longing for God. And we're trying to make that connection that Adam started to make. Now, if you, so that, that, that's, that's it for this morning. Our homework is to see every part of your day. You could see every physical phenomenon has a spiritual source. And the physical spiritual source is where this phenomenon is in its perfection. And the question is, can I learn to name this, call it by a name. Call it means to call forth. Can I connect this, th this physical phenomenon that I'm living in this life, can I connect it with its more perfect state, what, which is in heaven? And that's the naming of the animals that Adam begins with and we continue with in our own life. So Vicky wanted to know, did Adam name everything? Well, even if he did, he didn't name the iPhone. 
In other words, there were certain things he didn't name. So then it's our job to name it. In other words, connect this to its spiritual source. In other words, live this out in its more perfect, more perfect form. So the example of the prayer is a beautiful example. I love, I love, I want. What do I want? I only want because I want to be to feel good. I think that the cotton candy is going to make me feel good. What, but really where this stems from is the desire of the, of the, of the angel to be connect to God. Now, I, there's a gap between my source, the source of the animal soul and the animal soul. So the animal soul doesn't recognize itself. It cannot see itself connected to its source. So it says, no, the angel wants God and I want cotton candy. That's only before you named, you named the animal. Once you name the animal, you know that your source, the source of the animal soul, what you really want is you want the God. You want, you, want, you want the connection to God. You only want cotton candy because you know you're looking for something and you think that's what you want, but that's not really what you want. I mean, of course, you want the cotton candy, cotton candy, but to use for the connection to God, nothing wrong with cotton candy. But the point here is, in our life, we often do not see the source of the phenomenon that we're living. And this spiritual job of man, which is, again, a hybrid, a blend of heaven and earth, is to connect the physical phenomenon with this more perfect spiritual source. So that's, that's this idea. And I think this idea is, is mind-boggling because it's, the ramifications are profound and it's across every area of life. So it's a beautiful way to start the year and a beautiful way to start, uh, again, the second cycle of the Rebbe's essays. On, on, I think we're doing it for a little bit more than a year, but in the beginning, we didn't start to do Parsha. I think we only started Parsha next week of Noah. So I think now it's a, really a full cycle. So that's exciting. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh. Um, I just want to thank you. Again, this is just a very beautiful way to start the year. And, and uh, actually, that essay gives us a feeling for the purpose of poetry and all the literature in general, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to name um, the spiritual source for the physical existence. No, no. I think I, th I think I think that that's the the purpose of literature. Yeah, poetry. yeah. That, that, so the idea of naming is categorizing and naming things is really you're you're trying to experience it on a deeper level. But again, there are levels to that. And what Adam is trying to do, like I said, I can I can I can write poetry about my love, and then I understand it better. But but it's still physical love. But this dimension that we're talking about here is adding it, taking it to a far, far greater level that understand that my yearnings, my cravings are essentially what they really are, what they, their source. And then the subconscious, what they really are is cravings to, to, to become one with, with God, to become one with the, with the infinite oneness. And I don't see it that way only because there's a gap between the physical and spiritual that the angels cannot, uh, cannot, cannot bridge, but the human being could bridge. And that's why the angels cannot name this. They can't really define what it is. They can't see. They don't see in the physical craving a, a, a yearning, their own yearning to cleave to God, which what makes them animals. When they say the angel is like an ox, it means that just like the animal has a very passionate emotion and instinct. That's how the spiritual creations, that's how they yearn for God. Okay, Don't get in the way of a bull when the bull is raging. Human being, okay, he's not always, I want something. So what? Doesn't he? I'm going to run after it with the same force of an animal. Um, uh, uh, so the angels know they're called animals because their desire to God and their passion to God is intense. They see our passion and they say, yeah, okay, I know that there's some connection between the two, but I see no connection. I don't see how one is, is, one is a derivative of the other. I don't see how one derives from the other. But Adam says, no, you can connect the two. You can really see, you can, you can really understand and help the animal understand that what it really wants is a connection to God. And we do that during prayer. And we say subconsciously, we tell the, we tell the animal soul, look, your source also like to, uh, 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 your source is the holy, holy animals. So realize what you really want is really want the, the, the craving to the oneness. You really want closeness with the oneness or merging in the oneness. So you write about poetry, but that's only on one level. When you get to the spirituality, it takes it to a far greater level. Yeah, that's an endless process. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. And that's why this, the, the essay itself is going to go in different directions. There's the, there's the creation, there's the connection of heaven and earth that Adam achieves, but that's not as profound as the heaven and earth, the creation to spiritual, the connection to spirituality that we get at the giving of the Torah. And in short, so you don't have to wait till next cycle next year, or when we finish all the all, all the Rebbe's talks, which will be in a, in a few decades. But in short, not, you don't have to wait till the next cycle. The idea is that... Um, Adam connects the creation with its source, which is the godliness that is in the realm of the world. And then the giving of the Torah connects the world with the realm of godliness that transcends the world. So there's different levels within godliness that, that we connect to 
but that's already beyond the scope of, of, of this morning. Go, go ahead, Elisa, please. So is this connected? It sounds like this is connected. I think it was the, the Baal Shem Tov who said, like, when, when you think you, you want to eat a sandwich, you yeah. really want the essence yeah. of the sandwich. Yeah, so, so, so the Rebbe, in this edited talk, I don't think it appears in the edited talk, but this morning, I had a few minutes, I looked in the unedited talk of the Rebbe, and that appears there as well. So what Elisa is referring to is that the Baal Shem Tov taught Based on a based based on a verse in, in the in the uh, actually no it is here, it is here, it is here. The Rebbe is quoting his father-in-law, even though it's the it's father-in-law quoted the Baal Shem Tov. But okay, let me show you where this is. Let's 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 jump to page sixteen in this in this essay. In one of his letters, my revered father-in-law, the Rebbe Dayatz, writes that the body's hunger for physical nourishment stems from the soul's hunger for the spark of godliness invested in the food. This implies that even physical material entities, which seemingly concern only the body and the animal soul, are in truth connected with the godly soul. That bond is so strong that the body's natural hunger is merely an expression of the soul's hunger for godliness. The thing is, you have to be an atom to see it. You have to be a mensch. You have to be a person. You have to be able to, to that's the job, it's the work to be able to connect the two and sense within my physical aspiration, physical desire, sense also the desire of the godly soul. So that's the truth, but the sensing it and the feeling it, that's our service. That's our avoida, that's our service. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Everybody should have a wonderful day. And uh, whatever you're gonna do today, make sure you name, make sure you name all the physical phenomena, make sure you understand that whatever you engage in down here has a spiritual source where that same phenomenon is much more intense and holy and spiritual and wholesome. And our service is to say, could we connect it to, could we raise our existence and connect it more to the spiritual source? And the answer is we could, we, we're Adam. We have that, we have that blend. We have that, that ability to, to connect both heaven and earth. So thank you everybody, a wonderful day. That's your homework, at least till tomorrow at 10 a.m. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you.